wonderful. Thank you so much, Bill. Thank you to you guys for being here. Uh, there's many other places you could be, but you came here, and we're very excited to have you. I think it's a, it's a good time for all. And hopefully we learn a little bit, uh, particularly when it comes to not just the World Health Organization, uh, but as er David and Chris and Fred have mentioned before, the various shenanigans and uh, fun things that happen throughout. So I'm going to be talking about uh, what happened at the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. It was a, an amazing conference that we got to go to at New Delhi uh, a few years ago. This is right around the time that uh, Donald Trump was elected. It was right around the election time. Uh, very interesting to watch those figures come in while you're basically at a World Health Organization conference trying to understand what's happening and uh, seeing the craziness. Um, so I was there as a correspondent for the Pan American Post, uh, an online outlet that I've written for uh, over the years, and uh, had some really good stories to tell, and I, I want to start off by giving you a small example. Uh, in 2014, Canada, my home nation, withdrew from the UN Convention to Combat Desertification. Now this was seen as a huge deal in Canada. Oh, we're going to be a pariah, we're going to be laughed out of the room. And it was, it was very perplexing to a lot of people who follow this because the United Nations, obviously everything they do is amazing. There's no problem with the work that they do and there's no reason at all that we should criticize them. Then the people started coming out for Canada with the clause. There are 193 countries devoted to finding solutions for global desertification, and one country is opposed. Canada, that frozen rock on the northern part of the globe. It is the only one to pull out of the UN Convention. Please share. There's outrage activists that are getting angry and upset. And when Canada was finally asked why you're pulling out of this, it was very simple. It's that the organization itself doesn't do what it's supposed to do. The numbers that they studied, and Foreign Affairs Minister John Baird at the time looked at it, only 18% of their entire budget even went to combating desertification. The rest of it was just on administration, offices, travel, kind of putting people up to travel to go look at the, des the, the deserts and things like this. And it's something that for Canada at the time, uh, which was you know, more of a center-right government then, uh, they said, we're not interested in continuing to support bureaucracies and talk fests. Uh, Stephen Harper, he was uh, up, in the, up in the House of Commons and basically saying it's not an effective way to spend taxpayers' money. I give you that as an example of a country that is very nice, people that are very nice, people like us, uh, and a country that is committed to international principles, to the goals of the UN, but still can see issue with particular agencies or organizations really running awry of their original goals. So it's something that I think is, is very interesting and important to think about when we look at the FCTC. Uh, this is essentially the uh, treaty that the World Health Organization has put together. Um, there are now 181 parties to this. Uh, the United States is not a party to it. Very interesting to have the <coughs> global behemoth power of the United States not involved. And the United Kingdom is, is one of the biggest supporters, as, as Chris mentioned before. Uh, contribute 15 million pounds by 2021. A lot more to come into that. Uh, essentially how this works is that you have uh, huge rooms uh, with delegates from every uh, party country who are there to vote on the rules about the treaty that will be implemented. The treaty, the treaty, the treaty. Uh, this is the kind of the substance of how everything is discussed. It's the treaty. What does the treaty say? What will the treaty do? What are the rules around the treaty? If any of you have been to any UN conferences or organizations, about 90% of it is spent on what the rules are at the conference or convention. It's one of the craziest things ever. Uh, there's a lot of time that's wasted on that. If I'm a lawyer or any of these consultants, I'm probably making a lot of money uh, trying to figure out exactly who gets what and how it all works. So this is a picture uh, from New Delhi there. This was uh, the conference of the parties number seven. Uh, so this is when they were agreeing to particular policies that different countries would implement. Uh, I will talk a little bit more about those, but essentially the idea is that they're gonna totally limit the interests of uh, tobacco companies, industry. They're gonna make sure that, that we have taxes on tobacco, this is globally, that you have smoking bans in all public places, um, that the ingredients in tobacco that's regulated and you have the, the various labels, 
Uh, you have the 30% graphic warning at least on the packaging. Uh, you've seen that here, no, here in the United Kingdom. The public campaigns, the awareness, uh, the public bans on advertising for tobacco and also sponsorships, uh, which is huge. Uh, they're very big for sports. Uh, in the 1980s and 90s, you have a lot of tobacco companies funding NASCAR for a long time, for example, which I'm in, my family is involved in. You had uh, addiction programs, illicit trade, uh, obviously age restrictions, and then a lot of information sharing. Uh, I really would say, though, that the majority of what they were talking about was transparency and how much they were going to allow the media and the public to understand the deliberations of the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. Uh, it, was, it was kind of cool to see. We were in, in touch with the uh, press office there in New Delhi, and what was interesting is they were always putting this emphasis on transparency. We're number one. And the example that uh, the Secretariat gave at the very beginning, that's Vera Luisa de Costa de Silva, she said, we are an organization dedicated to transparency. And you could now see this on our tweet wall outside, which is their tweets. <laughs> Again, not, that doesn't mean anything about transparency. It just means that you hired uh, someone to put up a nice little tweet wall. Um, and there were many people who were from the media present, from many large uh, institutional organizations as well, civil society groups. And any of their comments on social media were not used at all, uh, were not discussed, and even they were encouraged not to provide any. Um, so the most important part of this entire convention, and why it is important for us, is that in the rules and in the treaties, their entire point and the most important section that they have is Article 5.3. Now this is trying to understand the influence of industry on the particular regulations. It's a valid concern. It's what international treaties do all the time. But the way that they've structured it within the FCTC is they made it so that any country that also it can somehow be affiliated with these interests is therefore banned from participating. Now, if you are a country that has a significant tobacco presence with farmers or anything like this, essentially you need to declare your conflict of interest uh, when you're debating these treaties. And many times these countries are actually left out of all decision making, uh, which, hey, whether or not it's good, these are the UN's rules. Uh, it's up to us, though, as taxpayers, as, as people following this, to understand exactly where that's going and what the intent is. And what we've seen from the FCTC lately particularly is, and again, I don't personally care much about tobacco, but if we look at everything that's going to be applied to that, they've admitted themselves that it's not just about that. It's about alcohol. It's about food. It's about soft drinks. Uh, there's a tobacco industry monitoring center which was started in Brazil just three years ago. The idea is to look at how industry deals with legislators. But the thing is, is they've now served this as a model for everything with soft drinks, with alcohol, with all types of food. And it's something that the UN, as we've heard before, is putting a lot more of the resources into combating. So I think that's it's a big part of their mission now. And to see that they're going to be using the uh, tobacco tactics to actually go after companies that provide you know, processed foods or alcoholic drinks, soft drinks. I mean, are we going to have a framework convention on food control, same type of thing? Whether or not we, we prefer to smoke or vape or eat potato chips, I think it's very... Uh, it's very important that we realize that there's a lot of the stuff that's being decided for us rather than by us. And I think there's a role for us to actually understand what this is, what the impact is, and how we can change it if we disagree um, with, with how it works. The bigger part of the FCTC and where the money actually is and where the action actually is is something called the FCTC 2030 Project. Uh, this is essentially where countries that are thinking about putting up any kind of tobacco reform measures, like I mentioned earlier, they're going to get flush with cash from various countries, mostly Great Britain and Australia. And they say technical support. We're going to give you workshops, we'll give you toolkits, we're going to do some webinars, uh, we'll bring in some other parties, we're going to fly in some World Health Organization members to kind of help you implement things. Uh, this is the kind of thing that happened in the Republic of Georgia last year. In April 2017, the FCTC 2030 announced that Georgia, the republic uh, there in the Caucasus, 
uh, would receive material support from the FCTC. So they would uh, receive a huge boost of cash from the United Kingdom and from Australia. And uh, not more than a month later, a bill was put forward, uh, very sweeping for Georgia, if anyone has ever been there, a beautiful country. Uh, obviously, a lot of people smoke there. Tobacco is a big problem. Smoking is a big problem. Um, but the kind of bill that they passed classified vaping as a tobacco product, banned all public smoking, mandated a 65% health warning, outlawed all ads, all types of um, advertisements that they're able to give, all kinds of sponsorships. Uh, whether or not we agree with it, we can see that that has come from this kind of nudging by the, the FCTC. Um, from the UN officials themselves, they said, the passage of the draft legislation aligns Georgia with its obligations as a party to the WHO FCTC and will help with the EU association agreement. Essentially, if you do not pass these laws, there's no way that you will be associated with the European Union. There's no way that we're gonna have any kind of visa regime with you nor trade regime. So it's become mandatory to pass whatever has been determined at the FCTC by various parties who are very hostile. Uh, you cannot further any kind of relationship with the European Union unless you pass these rules. So the kind of key takeaways from that is that Really, the goal of the SCTC, it's not necessarily just about cutting smoking. It's just about trying to obliterate tobacco industry, uh, which really, if you look at it, market forces will do that much faster than governments. It's very easy to see. We see that with the rise of e-cigarette and vaping companies now. But what a lot of treaty members are, unfortunately, is they're discouraged from even embracing any kind of harm reduction. Um, E-cigarettes are still illegal in many large population centers like India and Australia. They really don't want to talk about harm reduction and these kind of things, which the market, again, has provided a perfect way, and Dan will talk more about that, for people to stop smoking, which should be our goal. And what we've seen from the FCTC is they have this model of kind of financing, moving the money around, and making sure that uh, the rules are applied. And I have no doubt that the same thing is going to creep into the under industries. Uh, we see cannabis legalization that's going to become a reality in Canada this year. I have no doubt there's going to be an international treaty very soon to sort out what the rules on cannabis should be, apart from right now the current rule is it's illegal to have it legal uh, per the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. But you're going to see this kind of FCTC model of doing things applied to the various industries. And obviously at the end of the day, this is all public money. Uh, that the UK taxpayers uh, mostly pay for. Uh, fortunately, the Americans uh, do not, Canadians do, uh, Australians as well. So it's, it's something that we have to keep our eye on, mostly because this is something that could expand beyond other industries. It's something that could expand beyond what we're talking about now, when we're talking about tobacco and smoking, and could very much be the coffee that we're drinking, which IARC has uh, you know, wanted to put warning labels on, and the state of California put cancer warning labels on coffee, these kind of things. So you can imagine what the future will be. Uh, so thank you guys for your interest and your attention. Thank you.